morning. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, open our eyes that we may see, open our ears that we may hear, open our hearts that we may obey, be fruitful, and multiply. Fill us with your spirit, fill us with your joy. Teach us, Lord, to be cheerful givers of our time, of our treasure, of our hearts. Lord, we thank you for the example that Jesus gives us on the day we're going to reflect about today and the entirety of his ministry when he was with us long ago. We thank you that he's with us even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is alive and well and working in the world today. Amen. Amen. It was on a Sunday <clears throat> long ago, Jesus and his disciples had reached Bethphage near Jerusalem. Jesus, who so often before had said, my time has not yet come, knows now that his time is coming. It is time. Time to finish what he came to do. Time to fulfill everything the prophet said he was going to do. Time to complete the work of salvation for which he had come. He tells two of his disciples to go into the village. He tells them there's going to be a donkey and a colt. Bring them. They brought them to him. He got on them, and he began to ride, ride into town like a king. Not like a king coming into battle, not like a king going into war. If that were the case, he would have been on a horse-drawn chariot going forth as a conqueror. No, on this day, the Prince of Peace, our King Jesus, came into town in a lowly manner, riding on a donkey, as the prophet had foretold. Not without honor, no, on this day, our King, the Son of God, received great honor from the people. The disciples laid their clothes on the donkeys and colt on the donkey and colt before setting Jesus on them. And the people spread their clothes on the road, and they also spread branches from the trees on the road on which he was traveling. They were making a way for him, making a path for him, making a way of honor for him to enter into town. And they cried out, as David just read, Hosanna! Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! They gave the king his due. They gave the king what he deserved because he was worthy of praise. Still is. His first stop after entering Jerusalem was the temple. He cleansed it, drove out those who were conducting business in the temple, drove out those who were cheating the people, turned over the tables. He said, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then having made the temple an appropriate place to do good work, he went about doing good work, healing the sick, healing the blind, healing the lame, and receiving even more praise as he went about his father's business. And this upset the chief priests and the scribes. Isn't that funny? Isn't that, isn't that, aren't people just kind of like that? How so often when the Savior our master was simply going about doing his father's business that it upset the religious leaders. Sometimes this extreme devotion to God upsets modern-day Pharisees and Sadducees, even today, doesn't it? So they had to get rid of this son of David. They got to do something about this. Jesus, this miracle worker, Jesus, this healer, Jesus, the one who calmed the storm. Jesus, the one who put the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, and the scribes to shame with his arguments. They, couldn't, they look, couldn't lay a glove on him. The people, at least in this moment, rightly understood that the son of David had come. And they gave voice to that truth. They shouted it, at least in that moment, because he was worthy of praise. But the religious leaders didn't like it because he was a threat to their power base. So they disputed with the Savior. Do you hear what they're saying? 
Jesus wasn't bothered by that. He knew that the people were acknowledging the truth. Jesus knew who he was, and the people knew who he was. He was the praiseworthy Christ, the Messiah, still is. In another account of the same events in the book of Luke, we hear the Savior tell his critics that if these will not cry out, the rocks will cry out. So if he wasn't going to receive praise from the people on this day, if he hadn't received praise from the people, even the stones would have cried out, acknowledging that Jesus is Lord. The Messiah has come. What a day it was. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? And yet, we all know how this week um, ended. Not in praise, but in persecution. With the king arrested, tried in a kangaroo court, unjustly charged, the lying witnesses couldn't even get their lying witness to uh, agree with one another. Beaten scourged, ridiculed, blasphemed, shamed, crucified, with his body in a borrowed tomb. Albeit even in that, the words of Isaiah the prophet saying that he was going to be with the rich in his death because it was the tomb of a rich man, further fulfillment of the prophecy, further fulfillment that, that Jesus was the one, Jesus was the Messiah. The king was dead. But even in that was a fulfillment of the Father's divine promise. Because see, in the sacrifice of our Savior, salvation was obtained for all of us. If he had not done what he did, we could not have what we have. As Jerry said earlier, everything we do would be pointless had he not come to die, had he not been buried, had he not been raised. That's what gives this gathering meaning. There's all sorts of organizations that gather to do all sorts of good works. The Optimist Club, the Kiwanis Club, the, the Rotary Club, all sorts of organizations that do all sorts of good works. The church is one of those organizations that do good works. But ours have a, what we do has a meaning and a purpose that all the good doing in the world can never accomplish because of what he did in this week that began in praise and ended in persecution and furthermore ended in resurrection. More on that next week. Everything that happened on that Sunday when he entered Jerusalem to shouts of praise to that awful day in which he was arrested, humiliated, beaten, and crucified and to the glorious resurrection, resurrection Sunday when the tomb was empty. All of these were part of our Father's plan to save us. Thank the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. And praise to King Jesus because of that. He is worthy of our praise all day and every day. So, what is this triumphal entry? What, what is that Sunday, Palm Sunday that we call it? That day of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, what does that say to us? Well, so far, hopefully, we've learned that Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem was both a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. We see the fulfillment of the prophets, of the words of the prophets. And it's also just simply praise that he deserved. He deserved our praise. He deserves our praise. The second thing we learned from it was Jesus receiving honor on that day did not predict, was not predictive that he would receive honor every day. By the end of the week, what began in just praise and glory and power ended in humiliation and pain and torture and death. And of course, something else happened after that. 
And all of those, all of that, his receiving honor on this day and receiving hardships, stripes, pain, disdain, torture, death, less than a week later, all of those were part of God's plan. Both the exaltation and the humiliation, both the glory and the pain, all of that was part of God's divine plan and his honor and hardship and subsequent exaltation brought salvation to us. You see that? I hope so. Now, as we consider this week, we've already seen praise and persecution as he executed his father's plan for our salvation. Surely you can see that. Doesn't that give us a better perspective on our own experiences? It should. You see, as we walk in his footsteps, are we going to experience pain? As we walk in his footsteps, are we going to experience good things? We're going to go through this life and we're going to have good days and we're going to have difficult days. Just as our Savior had a great day that ended, it looked like it ended rather, in humiliation. And as we do so, receiving blessings and hardships, we do so knowing that as disciples of Christ, we also participate, as we participate in his plan, we also participate in his hardships, in his suffering, and we also participate in his victory. Isn't that good news? Our good days are part of his sovereign will and plan. Likewise, the difficult days, days that the apostle called, apostle Paul called it momentary light affliction. Now think about some of the things you've gone for, gone through. Was momentary light, affli uh, momentary light affliction utmost in your mind as you were going through some of your difficulties? No. But that's what the apostle called, called him. Now again, Apostle Paul, we know the great things he did. If I were to send out a piece of paper asking you to write down the sufferings he's in, he'd endured within a, just a few minutes, it'd be a pretty good list, wouldn't it? Stoned, beheaded at the end of his life, rejected by the people that he came to when he came to be a Christian. They didn't really welcome him with open arms. They, they, they rejected him. As he, as he welcomed the Gentiles into the church, he found himself in the middle of a controversy in which, in which Judaizing Christians hated him, and the Jews always hated him. So he had his share of hardships, and, and they were hardships that he called momentary light affliction. It's extraordinary, isn't it? Our good days are part of his sovereign will and plan, and our difficult days are part of his sovereign will and plan. James tells us, count it all joy when you endure various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. It's hard, it's, it's, our, it's not really our default position when trouble comes to go, woohoo! It's really not, is it? And yet that's the instruction of Scripture. That's the example of Paul, and that's the instruction that James gives us. I've mentioned my Aunt Eleanor before. One of my favorite things about her is as her life got old and her body broke down and she still continued working past when she should have, she, she, worked a, she owned an upholstery shop and she sat at that sewing machine. And on that sewing machine, she had a bumper sticker to remind herself, and it said, Praise the Lord Anyhow. And I think some days we just have to do that, don't we? It's good for us. So when we suffer indignity, pain, persecution, trouble, or trials, if we do this as a Christian, that's a good thing. And when we receive blessings upon blessings as we walk with Him, that's a good thing too. The main question that we need to answer, brothers and sisters, 
is am I following my Savior? Am I walking as Christ did? Am I walking in His morality? Am I walking in His faithfulness? Am I walking in His obedience? Am I walking in His joy? And especially in these days when to do so is to put ourselves perhaps into harm's way from a culture that has lost its mind, we might endure difficulties. Consider Joseph. One constant that defined Joseph, who was initially favored above his brothers, then sold by his brothers into slavery, then favored among the slaves, then falsely accused and sent into prison, then favored among the prisoners, then forgotten in prison, then exalted to second in command in the land of Egypt, then in a final test when his brothers came back, the betrayers who had set his whole adventure into motion. He had to deal with that. Do you see ups and downs? The one constant was he never quit trusting in his God. And he never quit obeying his God. We see that when he's a slave in Potiphar's house and he's being tested by Potiphar's wife as she's seeking to seduce him day after day after day. And he says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? We see him exemplifying that loyalty as a young man and it permeates his life as he goes through all of those difficult circumstances and as he goes through all of his triumphs as well. That never changes. Can you see that? And at the end of his life, when his brothers were afraid he was going to take vengeance against him, he said, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. So, so we see this in the Old Testament, uh, example, exemplified in Joseph. Good times or bad times, Joseph walked with God and trusted in him. We see it in the lives of the apostles. Good times or bad times. The apostles saved the son of perdition, Judas, walked with God, and they trusted in him. And we see it in Christ, our Redeemer. Right today, he's exalted to the right hand of the Father, having accomplished everything the Father sent him to do. But he had the same pattern as Joseph and the apostles. In fact, showed them how to do it. He's left us that example. Let his example be ours as we go through our own peaks and valleys and difficulties and triumphs all the way to a glorious eternity in his presence. Because you see, what finally has happened with Christ, as he went through his ups and downs, where is he now? He's at the right hand of the Father. And as Joseph, as he went through his peaks and valleys and trials, trusting in the Lord the whole way, where is he now? He's... he's in the bosom of Abraham, waiting for the final judgment when he's going to be welcomed into the new Jerusalem. And where are the apostles? Except for the son of perdition, they're all in the same place. That's our calling to faithfulness and to praising him good times and bad times. So let us recommit ourselves to honor him, to obey him, and to praise Him because he, is, because he is worthy of it all. Let's talk to our Father in heaven about it. Lord, Lord, we thank you for the examples that you've given us throughout Scripture. Today we looked at Joseph briefly, the apostles brief, briefly, and at Jesus extensively. May we be faithful like they were especially like Christ was. And may we praise him because he deserves it. Teach us to obey him and to praise him and to honor him with everything that we do. Because, Father, we want to be with him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may remember a, a really smart guy a couple of weeks ago had a graphic where it talked about our life. Right? Where we have the, the region of choice where we can go to heaven or make the decision about where we're going to go. And then in the middle, you've got the Hadean realm where the dead are. 
and they're either in paradise or they're in torment. And then we've got the final destination, either heaven or hell. That graphic was based on Scripture. That graphic illustrates in a very simple way where we are. Right now we're in the realm of choice. We can go to heaven. We can, we can make our destination sure one way or the other. In the Old Testament it said in one place, Behold, I've set before you life and death. Choose life. It's my hope, brothers and sisters, that if in this realm where sometimes we're walking with God and then sometimes we walk away from God, that if you found that you've wandered, you know, that line's dotted. Your salvation is not lost for good. It can be reobtained. So it's my hope that if you've wandered away from the fold, that you'll come back and that you'll make that known and that you'll let us help you in your journey so that, you, so that we all, everyone in this room, might see one another in the bosom of Abraham, in the presence of the Lord, and that ultimately we might all be welcomed together into the new Jerusalem. If you've never begun that journey, I pray that you would take seriously the message of Pentecost. When, they re when the people realized they had offended God and they were outside of fellowship with Him and they came to Peter and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Your eternity, your eternity with God can begin today if you choose. I pray that you would choose wisely. Come to Jesus while we stand and sing.